Well, good afternoon, everybody. Great to be with you. Um, there's not many functions happening during COVID, but it's so nice to be welcomed by the press club this afternoon. And it's really indeed a privilege, Greg. Um, as you know, my relationship with Lucy, I'm not in high demand, I've got a lot of competition. So <laughs> it's really great to share the podium with him um, this afternoon. And what a better time. Um, our nation's really in chaos, and, but yet there's huge opportunities. And, um, so in my address to you this afternoon, you know, you always think about what your angle is, and I always thought your, the angle should be your personal journey, and I think that's always important. But talking about my personal journey, I'm always mindful about two things. The first thing is that change is me by a market. <laughs> You know, to try and convince people of change, you really have to sell it. And if I look a bit grey, I am grey from just trying to convince them that what we're doing is actually quite a good trajectory. But the second thing is that I'm also convinced about that you really never change something by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you need to really get um, rid of the old and create a new model. And that's really what we're trying to do. And never before, COVID, do I really believe the time is now that people are really looking to change. And I call South Africa a bit of a speedboat nation. And what does that mean? It means that as a legislator going into to government in 1994, what a privilege it was for us as new legislators to change legislation because we could do whatever we wanted. The country was fluid. It was a new democracy. But I really believe things really haven't changed. It's still a new democracy, and I really still believe that a huge opportunity is for us to change. And uh, what a privilege it is the last two years to walk with Musi, and people ask, how did we meet? Actually, Musi made one major big good decision, and that was that he married a Lebanese woman, and um, I'm Lebanese, and so, um, I am, I'm still actually trying to teach him about um, Molochia and, and, and Tabuli, but he's not really taking to it. But um, I'm really trying to change it. But um, you might not know, but we do share, share the same Christian values. And more importantly, both of us have been leaders in a very difficult time in our country. And if you have to really ask me from my heart, why should you listen to us, is I believe, and I've listened to many academics, I've listened to many political writers, I've listened to so many people in my 28 years on the political landscape, but very seldom will you hear from people that have truly been in the belly of the beast of the political landscape. And so give us an opportunity to share that journey of why we're doing what we're doing because of our experiences. And what are the sum of the experiences that Musi and I are totally aligned on? And we truly believe that our political system is dysfunctional, broken, and it's all about factional politics. And me personally, I can't operate in a factional environment. <laughs> Maybe you can, but I can't operate. I wanted to focus on the goal line. I can't look on the side who's winning and fight for power for myself. Secondly, we know that we're not getting the young people to the polls. Um, the, the formal figures are that 17,9 million people went to the polls, 19,6 million people haven't voted before. And if we keep the status quo, how are we going to change this country if we don't get people to the polls, and especially um, our young people? And then it's about all new leadership. Um, I, we've got a Louis Group Business Academy that um, trains about 2,000 people, well, we've trained about 2,000 people the last five years. And we teach them about entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs. There are certain individuals that are made to be entrepreneurs and to work on their own. And then there are certain people that are intrapreneurs that want to work for corporate entities. And there are so many leaders in this country that are intrapreneurs that have been leaders of hospitals, educational facilities, that want to enter into the political landscape, but do not want to be part of a political party. And how dare we not try and create new talent to come onto this political landscape. And I really felt sorry for the president because I really believe, and I say it with great humbleness, I think he had to scrape the barrel to try and really make 
effective changes, um, and that's really my, my heart about it. And then last but not least, um, why we want changes is because we know that hardly any of you know who your accountant parliamentarians are, and we need to keep people accountable. They're not accountable, and we're living in a chaotic world, and we need to do something. And both Musi and I are really um, very committed to it, and I don't think you're really going to see it today, but we're two very different people. Musi is one of the most profound activists, and if I can say it, I hope he's not going to blame me, but Musi wants to look for a fight. <laughs> I mean it in a nice way. Um, and I'm more your advocate and your strategic person. I will be your relationship person and be your peacemaker and try and be strategic in the back room. That's where I feel comfortable. Musi, if you ride with him in the townships and he sees something going, he will stop the car and he will start activating on the ground. And personally, colleagues, I believe uh, we need leaders like that, and I believe Musi remains a great person with great experience and definitely a person that you must watch for the future. Um, I'm definitely one of his strong supporters. So what happened to me five years ago? Um, we had all these different commissions, the Van Slavic Commission in 2004, the Preach Report. Uh, we had um, <coughs> Michelante's High Level Report. All these commissions were saying we need electoral reform to change this country. Every single one of them. And what did this government do? The government leaders did nothing about it. Why? To feel mock. They had too much power. And so I went, even about seven years ago, to all, not all the political leaders, but some of the political leaders, and I said, please, we need electoral reform. We need to change the system. And all of them without fail said, Michael, a very good idea. We should do it. But do you honestly think that they would do it? Too much power. And I knew that the only way to do it was to go to the courts. And not just to the Supreme Court, but to the Constitutional Court. And very few people know the journey, because most people would say to me, but Michael, how are you going to affect electoral reform? Other countries have taken six to ten years to do electoral reform. Well, bad luck. We're already in our sixth year on electoral reform, because in May 2017, um, I found out from a friend of mine that there was a conflict um, in the Constitution in 191b that says every person has the right for public office, which was a human right in our Constitution, and the Electoral Act said that you had to belong to a political party. So nobody as an individual that wanted to stand up in this nation as a public servant could do it, that were forced to form, go to a political party. So, on to the courts, three high court judgments, three concord judgments, seven applicants, 12 senior counsel, four years, and on the 11th of June, 2020, a massive breakthrough judgment where it ruled that our electoral act was unconstitutional, what we dreamt about, and that parliament has two years now to change that electoral act, to, to actually give individuals the right to stand in government. But colleagues, the truth about it is my plight was really never for independence to stand. It was always as a trigger to actually do electoral reform. Because there are certain principles that Musi and I know that we are definitely, totally um, I'm convinced about. And what are they? We also know that um, the, the bosses of um, the political parties have just got too much power and we had to break it. So, where is this um, court case at the moment? I knew that if you're going to leave it to government, I've learned for many times, even in my business life, you always have to be above the curve. And so I got, um, 17 months ago, I got seven legal people, legal team with me. I said, guys, we're going to draft the electoral bill and we're going to start drafting it so that we can submit it to Parliament. Um, you can only go to Parliament in two ways, a petition or by virtue of a private member's motion. The only parliamentarian that was prepared to go to Parliament on our behalf was Terry Lakota, as a private member's motion. He lodged the bill um, last year, December, um, as a, it's called the Electoral Draft um, um, Second Amendment. And that bill at the moment is in Parliament 
And can you believe it, since then very little has been done about this bill. The good news is, is that the standing committee, um, uh, not the standing committee chairperson, uh, just by the way, the sad part about it in the demise that we're living at the moment, the moment we haven't got a speaker and we haven't got a chairman of the standing committee of Home Affairs because Bongo um, is um, also been asked to leave the standing committee portfolio. So can you imagine we've got one year left and look where this bill is. But the Home Affairs uh, Minister approached the standing committee and said, could I get a electoral reform committee to advise how our electoral system should look like in 2024? And he appointed Vali Musa, to, um, and Vali Musa got seven people to help draft this um, report. The report was lodged um, a month ago. It's called the Ministerial Advisory Committee Report. And to tell you the honest truth, I was blown out of the water by this report. It was so outstanding. Um, it's a majority report. He didn't have everybody conceding to what he's saying. But what is he saying? And I said to Brent, I wouldn't mind addressing um, the club in the future, talking about how the bill looks like, because I obviously led the team of drafters, and how do we elections look like in 2024. But what um, Vali Musa said is absolutely quite profound. He says that in 2024, we're going to have four, four votes. We can have two votes nationally, and we're going to have two votes provincially. And because proportionality is so important, you're going to vote one vote directly for your count, um, person in your constituency, and then secondly on proportionality, and then on province, exactly the same, direct election in your constituency, and then, um, and then proportionality. So the question is asked, why do we believe that independence really can make such a difference? And that's why I'm wanting to talk about my personal life a little bit. Imagine this man, I was in business, really doing very well um, in, uh, in a family business, and I decided to go into politics and resign as a director of six companies to start a political party. And when I said to my father, I wanted to go, he says, but why don't you form part of the DA, I want these other political parties. I said, no, Dad, I'm going to start something new. We started the Christian Democrats, and five months later, I was in Parliament. Um, and that's the Western Cape legislature, by the way. When I walked into Parliament, this is the truth, nobody recognized me, nobody greeted me, and I was one of these backbenchers that sat there, sort of waved quietly to these people. Three years later, the Premier approached me and said, Michael, I've got something to say to you. It's a long story. He says, we decided to make you a cabinet minister. I said, but Premier, how can you make me a cabinet minister? What are your own party people going to say? And I said, but please, if you want to appoint me as a cabinet minister, don't give me sport or culture, because I don't think I can add any value. <laughs> you know? He said, no, Michael, I'm going to give you public works and asset million, the largest portfolios in the Western Cape government. So what did I learn, colleagues? I learned that you don't need to belong to a big political party. I truly believe in the power of one. That is really my belief. And if you are sincere about being a statesman and adding um, a difference and making a difference, you can truly do it. And I don't want to talk about us, myself of what I've achieved, but I was so privileged to serve this nation and bring in issues like biosphere reserves. Do you know we didn't even have an asset, I come from a property family, we didn't even have an asset register of all the assets in, in the province to start collating it, having balance sheets, a profound effect to help and serve the nation that we um, love so much. So then we, um, we uh, that's why um, people say, but Michael, do you really believe independence can? I said, yes, but there's one big trick. You need to have a constituency-based system in this country because how can an independent candidate go and fight, fight on a national basis? I mean, how can you do it? The only way you can do it is to divide South Africa into constituencies. And that's what we promoted in the bill, and that's what Vali Musa has supported. And why is that important? Because we do believe power to the lowest level. And I do believe that in your constituency, there are great leaders that can stand up and truly represent the people. And OSA is a very big promoter, which is in our bill, 
of an open party list system. And most people don't understand the difference between an open party list system and a closed party list system. Now, what are they? So a closed party list system is what we've got in our country at the moment. You just put the flag or the symbol, the ANC, the DA, the Freedom Front, AC, you just put a symbol and anything can happen behind it. The political parties nominate the candidates and I'm not trying to say, but I've got some of them on heart, lung machines and now on pension, but they are there, you know. And we are saying, and we are saying that that is not fair. I know in the meetings that I've been, the young people are saying to us, you tell us who our leaders are. You show us their face, their experience, who they are, so that we as the citizens can nominate our top 400 people in our Springbok team. And that's why the constituency system is so different, so profound, that we can start being accountable to nominate our own leaders. I really don't understand um, colleagues, why we want to allow political parties to nominate our candidates are on our behalf. I do not believe it's right, and I believe it's time that we take back that power and nominate um, those people. So now, yes, um, Osa, we have to start something, Musi and I. I said, Musi, I said, believe, not political party number 31, that's not going to work. We've got this electoral reform. Let's get a social movement to promote what a vehicle of how we can affect change for people to be. And there's a different spirit in a social movement. I've been with that spirit of a political party. It's all self and it's power. A social movement is about influence and how you can work and collaborate together to make the country different. And that's why we started um, One South Africa Movement and most people um, still don't know of really what we are doing. So we decided we have to do something, what we call proof of concept. And what is that proof of concept? The proof of concept that we're saying we're going to local government election, people want to feel and touch that you're actually making a difference. And so we decided we could have easily have gone out and put up 200 or 300 or 400 independent candidates in the country. But I promise you, I think five would have made it, you know. So what did we do? We found a gap in our, um, in the Independent Electoral Commissions Act, which is section 15, which was totally profound and most people don't know about it. It says that for a municipality, for a specific municipality, you can form an organization. And for that organization, you can take part in that municipality. So what did we do? My first town was um, Cier um, the Cedarburg. I went there and I said to a man called um, uh, Arthur Gellis, I said, Arthur, get the chairman of the Ratepayers Association, the chairman of the Buddha for anything, the business chamber, the Young People Foundation. You get all the leaders of that town together and I want to address you. Got them together and we said, let me tell you about it. It's time that the citizens of the town don't rely only on government and political parties, that they take the power for themselves as leaders and they form what we call a 15A organization. You cannot believe the explosion that's happened. And um, OSA has announced that we're only going to take part in 10 municipalities as proof of concept only for one reason, that in those 10 municipalities we want to prove to the citizens because this is about active citizenry, we wanted to prove that we can govern, not just that we can have an influence. So we chose specific uh, municipalities like Grafrenet, Ubuntu, Nice, and the smaller municipalities, where we can really equip them, train them, and govern them, and try and see how we can be the balance of power to make a huge difference in these municipalities. But colleagues, what has happened? Since the looting that happened a month ago, Total explosion. We now have 40 registered community centers, community forums in the different towns that have now formed, that have said, we are wanting to take over our towns and govern. And the interesting thing about it is, is the type of leaders we attracted. I'm not saying it, I say it with respect to my colleagues in political parties. I think a lot of them are really struggling to get calibered leaders 
maybe the unemployed that wanted to stand as a candidate for a political party. We are attracting chairman of listed funds, chairman of ratepayers association, chairman of um, foundations. I cannot believe the leadership caliber of people that we are attracting in these municipalities. And so our call is, is that we're working with now, uh, we only going to have proof of concept of 10, but I'm wanting us to get 50 or 60 community centers where we'll be their arm bearer, because why not facilitate and help people to take over their municipalities? And as you might have seen, that there's um, 45 municipalities that the ANC has declared as delinquent municipalities, 45. There are 200 out of 238 municipalities that are bankrupt. Must we have a selfish agenda and worry about our political power instead of seeing how we can go and help and equip those municipalities to lead? And I'll tell you what um, OSA is really doing about it. So where's OSA moving to? And what are we doing in the next couple of months that you can watch? Firstly, definitely focusing on the direct elections bill. We wanted to stand every day at Parliament with placards and counting because they've got a year left, 232 days left, 228 days left, and really count. This is one mission that we're not going to give up. Put it on your forehead, it's going to happen, and we're going to fight for it with everything that we can because that's what this country deserves. Secondly, I'm going out full time to look for collaboration with strategic partners, organizations, NGOs of individual organizations that can really work with us to achieve our goal. Thirdly, I'm working very hard to put up a corporate fund, and the corporates are wanting to help us with delinquent municipalities and said, we'll give you money to help putting data in the townships, giving sewerage, giving everything, and this corporate fund is being affected um, at the moment. Then I'm very pleased to let you know that how can we get statesmen and women into government if we don't train and equip them? So OSA has started a OSA Academy, which we're launching next month, where we've got outstanding CETA accredited programs, which are digital, and it's translated in five languages that are in public administration and in business administration. It's three weeks to six weeks to three months courses, and we're already getting funding uh, where we can sponsor these from corporate skills, levies, etc. And we hope, um, hopefully, Jessica and, and, and Jack and them all here, we can get our first hundred in by the end of the year. But I believe training of statesmen and women is so critical if we really wanted to change the political landscape. Then last but not least is that we're very committed to start an independent candidate association to professionalize um, the whole thing about independent candidates. And it's going to be like the Law Society of South Africa or the Medical Association where independent candidates can subject themselves to integrity, to the values, sign packs, but also that we can teach them the best practices, training, and equip them and train. And even in legal battles, um, if they are having to fight legal battles, to help them fight legal battles to, um, to get past the winning line. So colleagues, I'm closing by saying to you, um, I believe it's time to, to stand up and serve this nation. I believe we have to be um, active citizens. Just by the way, um, a lot of people said, but Michael, we don't want to be, um, become involved in politics. Do you know what the Arabic translation is of politics? It means devoted citizen. You can choose if you want to be a devoted citizen or not. So I loved my personalities. I love to have a generosity to, um, gene, to reach out, to collaborate to ask people to work with us, even political parties, because I'm wanting to make an urgent statement. What OSA does is not anti-political parties. We all need to stand together. For instance, in the small towns, and I sort of lifted these towns, I haven't even, um, I don't even really know how to pronounce them, but Nuledi, Ratu, Matsulani, Swangeli, are small towns in the rural, uh, small municipalities in the rural areas only the governing parties involved there. Many of the political parties have got members there, but for them to go and fight these municipalities and things is really ludicrous. Why don't they be part of a civil movement and, and let us help and train and equip to take over these um, municipalities? So I close with one of my favorite quotes. It's from Emerson, which says, 
Do not go where the path may lead. Go where there is no path and leave a trail. I come from a generational business. I know the power of a generational business. I know what it is to leave a legacy. That's what we must do for our next generation. But we can't do it alone. Let's collaborate, reach out, and form a new trail. I thank you. So when you say old protocol observe, just stick your elbow out, then it works out okay. Good afternoon, fellow South Africans. Thank you so much for the kind privilege to be able to address you this afternoon. Certainly a, an institution such as the Cape Town Press Club plays a vital role in the discourse of our democracy and the people that we work with. So, and I'm grateful to have members of the media here. Also grateful to have our team from One South Africa joining us here today. And I'm hoping that in the next few minutes, we could share really a new sense of hope for where our country is. I think none of us can deny that as I speak to you this afternoon, President Ramaphosa is appearing before the State Capture Commission. And so therefore, and has recently reshuffled his cabinet. I think all of us can recognize the fact that in both those respective actions, all of us know that this has brought about a grim democratic reality. You know, you don't, you don't have to track too far, but you realize on Twitter we've got one president at a commission and another sitting in a hospital, stroke, prison, stroke, wherever. Surely this must remind each one of us that our models of accountability have failed. And ultimately, I think, like you, like me, you certainly feel a moment in our country. So this, is, this is one of those moments where something needs to happen. Our country is reeling from the riots and the looting that took place a number of weeks ago. It's a country, in effect, with an economic outcome that destines young people to the doldrums of unemployment where effectively two out of three young people cannot find a job in this country. Let, let that in many ways sink in. Two out of three young people in this country cannot find a job. We live in a country where if you say you are going to end corruption, it's merely a slogan, but it really delivers no subsequent action. I'm a husband to one wife, a father to two girls and one boy. And when we look at the month of August, we live in a country where women in our nation don't feel safe from their partners, from their neighbors, and the broader society. So let's accept this first basic truth. That we need urgent reset, we need urgent reform, and we must realize that the party, the politics, and the liberation movement have all come to an end. You see, what we're going through in this country is a simple problem of a dominant party political system that operates with effectively zero accountability. Our constitution, so progressive, so celebrated all over the world, envisions that a member of parliament who holds the interests of the people over the party. I, I'll, I'll never forget the day I took 
my oath in Parliament. You know those famous words, I will defend this constitution. But in your business, in your course of work, what eventually happens is that I will defend this party. I'm reading an incredible book at the moment called Extreme Ownership. And in the book, there's a famous line that says, it's not what you preach that gets done, it's what you tolerate. And I'm afraid as a country we've tolerated mediocrity, we've tolerated failing, and sadly it is what we're getting. It was the year 2007, 2017, I'm going to Parliament and we'd had this incredible time where we had these famous motions of no confidence and we moved yet another one in President Zoom. In fact, I came to the Cape Town Press Club to speak precisely about why we were moving a motion of no confidence in President Zoom. I remember many of our media commentators coming to me saying, you move another one, that's the way you unite the ANC. You bring them together. And then I used to have the pride to remind them that why are we moving one? We're moving one because I've been to Nkat. I've seen President Zuma's new lavish place. I've seen what a swimming pool looks like. <laughs> I've seen for myself the lavish palace that Mr. Zuma had built for his chickens and his animals whilst his neighbors we're living in conditions worse <coughs> than those. But I had the great privilege to serve in the Nkanda Ad Hoc Committee. And I want to look at one Mamoloko Kubai. She was the leader of the ANC's cons uh, 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 MPs who came on the committee. You may not Remember, but she was famously the one painting her nails throughout the committee. We discussed many things, but my, the main conclusion of that whole committee was that here was Mamoluko and others convincing South Africans in a report that what looked to me like a swimming pool was in fact a fire pool. See, South Africans, we quickly forget how fortunately for her, and unfortunately for us, that glorious day of pronouncements gave her a promotion. Instead of accountability, she ended up being moved up the ranks. She's been the Minister of Energy, the Minister of Tourism, recently the Acting Minister of Health, and now the Minister of Human Settlement. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want a promotion, Figure out what a swimming pool is, right? <laughs> because it does remain true that instead of accountability in this country, what we get is often an alternate reality. Instead of voting for people, we have members of parliament voting in defense of the party. And rather than voting with their conscience, we get people voting for their salaries. This is the very antithesis of what democracy is. It is what goes wrong when a party can be solidified around a corrupt individual. And in fact, state capture is first a policy which can quickly morph into corruption. My first job was working at Total Sports selling shoes. And in retail, we have a famous saying that says, you sometimes run specials that say, buy one, get one free. And what state capture is, is you buy one president, you can get the whole party, including the deputy, for free. What we are proposing is that let's break away from that. In the UDM versus Speaker Constitutional Court case, the court upheld the principles of accountability in a unanimous decision. The court reminded us that members of parliament have to ensure that the will or the interests of the people find expression through what the state and its organs do. 
This is so because Parliament is elected to represent the people and to ensure government by the people under the Constitution. Members of Parliament are required to affirm or to swear faithfulness to the Republic and obedience to its Constitution and laws. No way does the Supreme Law provide for them to swear allegiance to their political parties, important players, though they are in our constitutional scheme. Close quote. Unfortunately, that is exactly what's happened. And in fact, is still happening. The party has taken precedence over the people. That is why in the State Capture Commission, it's only traversing issues of democratic centralism and cadre deployment. That is why, sadly, as Michael so eloquently put out, that cabinet cannot find new blood. As the Twitterati said famously, if you have four punctured tires, reshuffling them around the same vehicle doesn't change the destination. <laughs> A party politician is loyal to his donors, to his party, and ultimately to his position. The people are the last in their minds. I, I know this from first-hand experience, and that's why in many ways when people ask me why I leave party politics, it's because I realize the system is no longer working. That in fact party politics are the reason we're here. They, in many ways, that's the heart of the problem. I've seen too often speakers of parliament protecting bad leaders, shielding them from questions, shielding them from motions of no confidence, muddying the debate. We've seen cabinets full of yes men and fire pool spin doctors. Why? This is because accountability, the accountability mechanism in this country is broken. It's further broken by the fact that, in the main, our political infrastructure still resembles that of 1994, where we've got race-based parties, or region-based parties, or ethnic parties. So their first defense is not the Constitution. It is my tribe, my race, my ethnicity, rather than the people who elect them to serve. When I walked out of the doors of Parliament, I remember thinking to myself, we've got to do anything. If we're going to build one South Africa, it's we've got to build a center where upon which men, women, black and white, regardless of where we come from, we could work together, prosper together, and live peacefully together in this beautiful country of ours. Surely, this is a dream we all ought to be waking up to. Bound together. Not by ideology, not by tribalism, but truly values that make us who we are. As an African, many of those values can be summed up by the value of Ubuntu, the sense that I am because you are. So if the current isn't working, I'd argue we need electoral reform. We desperately need a constituency based representation. And I want to give you just three reasons why I think it'd be better. And in fact, I know it would be better. Number one, there's a clear direct connection to the area. If you want a clear direct connection to the area, it leads to acting in the best interest of that area. If, for example, in the recent lootings, imagine if the MPs from that area were the first one to stand up, to raise the issues aggressively and with authenticity. Like all of us, we all watched on television the drama unfolding for all of those days. But where were the MPs from Alexandra, from, Khaut, from Soweto, from, from KZN? Where were those MPs? Where is the MP for Phoenix as we speak right now? Surely, at first place, there must be someone standing up saying, I will speak on behalf of this community. It furthermore, not only in the defense of what's going on, articulates quite strongly the idea of planning and budget allocation. Imagine, as I was two weeks ago in Sidi Bay, in Mfule, 
Where if you arrive there and you saw the work that is happening at the Val Dam or the lack of work, where is the MP that is standing up asking the question, well, we had the army deployed to fix the Val Dam and nothing has happened. We have a municipality that's fa that's failing in the, that, that is failing to look after the Val Dam. And more than anything, nearly 43% of citizens who live in Gauteng face the prospect of drinking water that is contaminated. But who's the voice for those people? We need to do better. So I, I, I maintain that unless we reform the Electoral Act, all this current government is, the ANC, will always end up as an elite project of self-enrichment at the expense of the poor people in our country. Secondly, I would argue strongly that we need electoral reform because communities actually know who their leaders are. They know where the people are from, they know where the people grew up in, and effectively, they know who their characters are. They know what kind of leadership acumen the very person has. And so it means we're likely, if we go to the community, speak with the community, that they are the ones who will know how to elect an effective candidate, rather than simply a party arriving and saying, this is your candidate, live with it. See, I grew up in Soweto. And Gokasi, we use the famous saying, which means we don't fall for trickery. We know who the people are. I can tell you, I used to walk around the streets of Dobsonville. I know who, which people were robbing who. We knew which people were doing what. We also knew which people were leading what. So if you gave the people of Soweto the right to choose who their leaders are, I'm certain half of the crop that we find in Parliament wouldn't make it there. Mm -hmm. We know who the councillors are. So my fellow South Africans, we have to get back to the very heart of democracy being by the people and for the people. That's what goes on into the heart of leadership. So as one South Africa, we are indeed broadening the pool from which candidates are selected. Because, in truth, leadership isn't just the preserve of political systems. If only parties produce leaders, then people like Charlotte Matege, such a powerful woman activist, was fighting for a cause, not beset on political office bearings with all of its trappings. These were people who understand to fight for their community didn't always mean they'd end up being ministers or deputy ministers, but these were people who were willing to fight for their community, regardless of where it ended up for them. I want those leaders. Because you know, when the party says defend the party in corruption, they say, hey, you didn't vote for me. Is the people in Soweto, in Kenilworth, in Cavendish, in all communities who voted for me, that's who I'm here to defend. That's a democratic dream that I think as South Africans was infused into our constitution so subtly to say, let the people, let the people lead. We somewhat missed it and allowed it to say, let the parties lead. Thirdly, I think there's an advantage. Finally, the president can be freed from just choosing from his friends, his faction, his people. He can construct a more robust cabinet full of professionals, and technocrats. Imagine if right now we could pick a Minister of Health from elsewhere, from a new talent, rather than just simply say, let's scrap the barrel for what sits in Parliament, or what sits within this party. It's truly won't be a government of national unity. I don't endorse that view. But I do endorse a view that says we must build a government of the best talent. So the choice is before us. We can choose more of the same, more corruption, more inequality, more poverty. We can keep playing musical chairs of incompetence. We can keep hoping that there'll be a new leader and the ANC will come with new song and give us another new dawn and another new dawn and another new dawn. But my friends, I think that's false and it's a false hope. It's a hope we cannot afford. We must stop dreaming. 
we must in fact start building. This requires us to identify the design flaw in our young democracy. That a party-centered model only, only creates a political oligop oligopoly. We need to imagine what good governance looks like and fight like hell for the realization of those reforms in time for 2024. The Constitutional Court ruled last year to say government must do its job. It's those who benefit from the inertia that is stopping progress, but you and I can't allow them. The media that is here must hound every politician and make sure these reforms see the light of day. I'm fighting. I'm fighting every day in communities and all of that. And that's why we're here, because I think this is such a profound fight for our democracy. Our democracy deserves better. And as Michael said, there's only less than, I uh, worked it out accurately, it's 303 days till next year, June the 11th, which is when the Concord and Parliament must in fact rule on this issue. Or must table a new law. We shouldn't allow them to go back to the Constitutional Court to apply for an extension. What we should rather be asking them is to say, do your job as prescribed by the Concord and amend the electoral law now. Because in truth, reform delayed is democracy destroyed. Reform delayed is freedom denied. Young people are tired of the system. It's why they're not voting. Our country can do better. And if we don't, let's accept. Let's accept there'll be more unrest. Let's accept that we'll have no accountability. We'll ultimately, and this is the warning, any of you have spent your lives saving up in this country, we will descend quietly into a failed state. It doesn't take one moment. It takes small steps and adjustments along the way that move you off course towards yet another failed state. Fellow South Africans, I, I want to conclude by addressing this very grave matter that we face today of constitutionality that is before us. Many people say if we defend our constitution, we defend our democracy. Recently we've seen COVID spikes and we've seen a convenient excuse of COVID saying it is sufficient to postpone elections. Let me put a stake on the ground. Moving elections from October to February will not change COVID. Elections are going to take place under COVID regulations. So the only question that is before us is whether the IEC will be ready to hold those elections. So I'm here to tell you that I have joined the court action to oblige the IEC to hold elections urgently. <coughs> this is not a, a small thing you and I must just sniff at and think, oh well, let's postpone and see. This is sacred to our democracy. It's vital that you can't just allow your constitution to simply be amended by those who apply to the Concord. More than anything, imagine if you told the people of America, please stick it out with President Trump for as long as you like, because we've got COVID. Imagine if you went to Malawi, and said, we, we know the current president kind of rigged the elections and they had the famous TIPEX elections, but at least let's hold on for a while until there's post-COVID. Imagine like Zambia today goes to the polls and you said to President Lungu, listen, you don't have to worry about it. Just wait until the end of COVID. 
yeah, I like everybody wants a free and fair election. So I don't want anyone to die. And in the same vein, I send my kids to school every day, knowing that the Department of Education must do its job to make sure there's social distancing, there's proper, um, they all are wearing masks, they do the job. So if 12 million citizens go to school every single day, what's to stop us over three days allowing citizens to actually go cast what is their democratic right to hold the government to account? If we can send our kids to school, we can send citizens to work. So I'm joining the action, standing for the fight. Because it's, I would never want for my kids to look at me and say, Daddy, what did you do when they went to the Concord to apply for an amendment of your sacred constitution? I want to proudly be able to say to her, I stood up. I stood up, and I hope you will too. Our country needs it more than ever. See, declines of nations are not instant. They take small steps, adjusting of election dates. Soon the election results don't matter. Soon accountability is forgotten. And then we live in yet another state. Whether that be Russia, whether that be Zimbabwe, they all have similar features when it's said and done. There's a moment in our nation. It's a moment we stand up. Michael closed with a famous quote. I'll close with one that invited me to politics. One by Winston Churchill. That says, there comes a time where every man is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and asked to do something great, something fitting to their talents. What a great tragedy it is when the moment comes and finds them unprepared for the task, which would be his finest hour. Our nation has been tapped. Let's stand up. Thank you.